If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of 1 Peter? We're in 1 Peter chapter 2 today as we continue our study. 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'm going to read from verse 4 through verse 12. I love it when you bring your Bibles, and don't be afraid to underline and mark and take notes as God is speaking to you. We're starting in verse 4, as you come to him, referring to Jesus, the living stone rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from the sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they may accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. We'll stop there. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to read the book called The Pilgrim's Progress. Maybe some of you studied it when you were in high school and you were taking British, British literature at the time. But it's an interesting book. Let me just share some of the facts about this book that make it so unique. It was written in 1678 by John Bunyan, who was a preacher. He was in jail at the time for preaching the gospel. And as he was in jail, he had this idea, almost a dream, if you will, about this guy who would be traveling from this world to the next. And so he named the principal character Christian, who was traveling from the city of this world to the celestial city. Well, that book, as it was written, became so popular that over the hundreds of years since it's been written, it is the most read book apart from the Bible in every part of the world. In fact, as he wrote it, and immediately it was published, it began selling so many copies that by the year 1692, just 15 years after, it was still selling 100,000 copies a year. This book has been translated in well over 100 different languages. And what makes it so unique in the different languages that it was translated in was when... China decided to have a single book that they thought best represented American culture or, or Western culture. They chose to publish The Pilgrim's Progress and 200,000 copies were sold in China within three days. It was absolutely amazing. This is the one book apart from the Bible that has never been out of print. Now, for those of you who are movie buffs and know the actor Liam Neeson, you might be interested in knowing that Liam Neeson's first movie role was actually in a 1970s version of The Pilgrim's Progress. And this whole thing is about one man's journey of faith. It's interesting to think about that because 1,600 years earlier, the Apostle Peter wrote a book about our journey of faith. And 
as he's writing to each of us and saying, look, the moment you get saved, the moment you come to Christ, you start traveling this journey of faith, and it's not always going to be an easy road. There are going to be a lot of challenges that you're going to face. There are going to be some real obstacles and bumps and different things that you're going to have to deal with. Now, before he talks about the challenges of the journey, he says, I need you to understand that these things are coming. And when they hit, he begins by saying, before you get rattled because the journey is uncomfortable, I want you just to pause to praise. Praise God, the one who created you, who called you, who redeemed you. And praise and say thanks not only for this relationship that you have with God, but thank God for your salvation. Praise him for this eternal gift that God has given you that is worth more than gold and all the treasures of the earth combined. This salvation that is a living part of who you are today, and it's going to carry you right into eternity. Then, as he says, now it's time to get ready for the journey. And there are some things that you have to do to get ready, get ready for any journey. When we're going camping, we pack the trailer up, we get all the groceries, we make sure that we have our suitcases ready. And when you're traveling on this journey of your faith, Peter writes and says, there are four things that you need to get ready, four things that need to be a part of your life so that this journey that you're on will be successful. You need to learn how to walk in holiness. You need to love others. You need to get rid of the dead weight that holds you back, all that old stuff from our culture and your past, the sins that slow you down. And then instead of getting weaker as you travel, you need to learn how to get stronger. Now, these four themes are going to show up over and over throughout the book as we're talking about our journey of faith. But there's... Now, now it's time to travel. And I wonder, how many of you have ever been out of the country? You've gone to any other country in the world. Great, wow, look at all these. Okay, now, when you're traveling and you fly into another country at the airport when you get there, you meet somebody who's always going to ask you two questions. The first question is, who are you? They're going to want to see some papers. They're going to want to see your passport. They want to know who you are. But the second question they're going to ask you is, well, why are you here? What business do you have in our country? How long will you be staying? And what are you going to be doing while you're here? It's so interesting that Peter addresses those very same issues with us. When you've started this journey of faith, you're now no longer citizens of this world. You are essentially citizens of another world. And that's why Peter says you have to think of yourself as a foreigner, as a stranger to this country. And when you're in another country as a, as a foreigner, you need to be prepared to answer these two questions. Who are you and why are you here? So let's break these down. The first question, who are you? When you're standing in line at the airport and you've got to check in, how many times do you hear them say, would you make sure that you have your ID ready? They want your driver's license. They want your passport or something to see who you are. And in the Christian perspective of this, we need to know who we are for a very important reason. Peter writes and says that when Christians forget who we are, then we easily get confused about the purpose for our journey as well. So this morning, we're going to tackle both of these issues. And when we're thinking about who we are as followers of Jesus, Peter writes and says that there are four descriptions about who every one of us are. The first one he gives us is that we are a part of a spiritual family. Now, this goes back to chapter 1, verse 23, where Peter writes, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. Peter is reminding us right off that our spiritual birth heritage is that we are children of God. Now, 
When I was growing up physically in my family, this is a picture of my family that was taken just uh, five years ago, just a couple months before my dad passed away. And we had a big family reunion at their home church up in Zion. And it was so cool. And being with the family, I remember when I was a kid, you know, the my teachers and my parents' friends who knew our family would often say to me, Steve, you have your dad's voice and your mom's eyes. And I can't tell you how many times I heard that. You have your dad's voice and your mom's eyes. I decided to have some fun with that one day. I was home from college and I was sitting there in the dining room talking with my mom and dad. They were sitting at the table and uh, all of a sudden the phone rang. So I picked it up and, hello, and... Somebody said, hi, Ralph, is Dot there? And I knew right away they thought I was my dad. And so I said, yeah, sure, Dorts. So I called my mom, and she, they didn't know what was going on. And then just before I gave the phone to my mom, I said very deliberately so they'd hear me in the mouthpiece, I said, oh, come on, give me a big kiss before you talk. My my dad could not believe what I had just done. He was, my dad had a great sense of humor, but he was not a silly person. And I loved doing that kind of stuff to him. And now, in the same way that somebody would look at you and say, oh, you look like your dad, you sound like your dad, you think like your dad, that's exactly what Peter is saying we need to do spiritually. When people look at us, they go, oh, you look like your father. You talk like your father. You think like your father. And we are to live as obedient children because our behavior, thinking, and values reflect our family heritage. God is living in you and through you. And his spirit should be shaping you every day so that everything about you causes people to go, Oh, you remind me of your father. You're part of his family. It should be a natural thing for the believer to think and live like God. Peter says, the first thing you need to realize and remember about who you are is that you're a child of God. But then he pushes us even farther and he says, not only are you a child of God and part of this great spiritual family, but you're part of a great spiritual house that God is building. In chapter two, he gives us this in verses four and five when he says, as you come to him, Jesus, the living stone. Now the word living is important here because Peter is reminding them we don't have a person like who is a dead stone, a used to be stone. Jesus is alive. He is alive and he is living in you. You come to the living stone who was rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him. And you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. Peter is writing to us and saying, look, God is at work and he uses this as analogy of a house, a home that is entirely of these stones. Now, you may not be able to see it because of the lighting, but up in the upper right hand corner, I found a picture of a house that's just entirely stones and each one of them were fit together in a perfect pit way so that the house is strong and healthy and and you and I are these living stones that God has chosen and he is building this house along with every other believer who has ever lived for 2,000 years the church has been growing the house has been growing and God is taking each one of us in this amazing way that he's created us with all of our gifts our spiritual gifts our personalities our resources resources, our talents, all of these things that shape the stone the way it is. And he says, all right, now I'm going to fit you in exactly the perfect place that I want because I'm going to have this building, if you will, this building that is beautiful, this building that is strong and safe, this building that is impacting the world. You have all been chosen and created for God's unique purposes. And he's fitted you into this place that we call the church. 
And with all of your strengths and talents, with all of your spiritual gifts and resources, God is saying, I want you to fit in and be a part of the work that I'm doing in the world. The Apostle Paul celebrates this concept of us being a spiritual house when in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 he says together all of us are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and Jesus Christ himself is the cornerstone that foundational part that makes it so amazing and strong and perfect it's what brings perfect alignment to everything that God is doing I love this picture of Jesus being the cornerstone because Peter picks up on that and he says, hey, Jesus is a stone. And in fact, he describes Jesus in five separate ways as a stone in our lives and in this house. He is, in verse four, the living stone. In verse six, he is the chosen stone by God. In verse 6, again, he is the honored stone. Now, your translation probably says the word precious, but the word in the original Greek language is more literally honored. He's not just precious as in, oh, I like him so much, but he's exalted and honored. And that picks up again in verse 7 as the exalted stone that God has raised up. And then in verse 8, for those who are unsaved... He's the stumbling stone, the stumbling stone. Have you ever been on a journey, you're hiking, and all of a sudden as you're going down this path, you didn't even see it, but there's this stone or a root that you're, you walk by and, uh, and you trip, and that's exactly what happens in the lives of unbelievers, people who aren't willing to submit and surrender to Jesus. They stumble over him. And to make this point so clear that Jesus is that messianic stumbling stone to unbelievers, then Peter quotes from the Old Testament several times. And each one of these prophecies refer to Jesus. In Isaiah 28, he says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. That's us who embrace Jesus by faith. We'll never be put to shame. But for the unbeliever, he's going to be a problem. In, again, in verses 7 8, Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. He's highly honored. But to those who don't believe, now again, he quotes from Psalm 118, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And again from Isaiah 8, a stone, Jesus is a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. He pushes one more time and with another quote from Isaiah 8 and says, uh, excuse me, that's the same quote. But he makes this point then and says, these people stumble. The only reason they stumble is because they refuse or disobey the message. Now look, this is, this is an important point that we have to understand, especially in a book as challenging as First Peter is. When we had our first lesson, we saw that God uniquely chooses us for salvation. I know that's it's a hard concept for a lot of us to grasp, that God sovereignly looked ahead and chose to have a relationship with us. But God's choosing does not negate human responsibility, human choice as well. See, it's paradoxical to suggest that God both chooses us and we must choose him. But both are absolutely true. I don't understand how they work together. This is an infinite truth, and believe me, I'm always going to be finite, and I'll never fully grasp this, but both are absolutely true. Every appeal of the gospel in Scripture is directed towards our free will to choose Christ. Every one of them. And when 
people hear the gospel and are invited to respond by receiving or trusting in Christ, they either submit and accept the truth or they stumble, refuse, and disobey the message. Every single person who refuses to believe is responsible for their sin and their choice. Can't blame God. Oh, I wasn't chosen. I, again, I don't understand how all of this works. It's like looking at a horseshoe that's connected at the top, but we can't see above. God has no problem with this. He sees the whole thing. All you and I are seeing are the legs, sovereign choice, free will, but both are true and both connect. I'm so glad that you have chosen to receive Jesus. I'm so glad if you're a follower of Christ that you have chosen and embraced him so that you could be a part of this amazing spiritual house. And I hope that as you're here and you're a part of the body of Christ at Village Church, that you're going to fit into that perfect place of serving God as he's prepared you and shaped you for the kingdom work he has for you. So Peter tells us, first of all, we're a part of a spiritual family. Secondly, we're a part of this spiritual house that God is building. Then he takes us to the third description of who we are, and he says, you're a part of a royal priesthood. Now, this is interesting. Any Jewish person who heard this term or read it would say, a royal priesthood. Now, the priests all came from a particular tribal line in Israel. And that wasn't typically the tribal line that kings came from. They wouldn't have had any trouble saying, oh, that's interesting that we're priests, but that we're royalty as well. In verses 9 and 10, Peter does put it this way, though. You are part of a royal priesthood. God has made us uniquely to be kings and priests before him. When John is in, in this stage of his life where he's suddenly being taken up into heaven in this amazing vision and Jesus is there and he sees all these people worshiping and celebrating in heaven. John just celebrates everything that's happening in Revelation 1 verses 5 and 6 and he says, all glory to him referring to Jesus who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He, Jesus, has made us a kingdom of priests. And some translations actually say kings and priests. But we are a part of this amazing kingdom of priests for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever and ever. You and I have been called and given an amazing privilege to serve God as priests. Now, when you think of the Old Testament priesthood, they had four general responsibilities. If you were a priest, you were involved with administrating the sacrifices that we people would bring, whether it was at the tabernacle or the temple. And besides working with the sacrifices that were being brought, you also, especially if you're the high priest, you had the responsibility at times of communicating God's will. To the people. The high priest had two particular stones that were kept with him in a bag, and there would be times when the people were going, What's God's will for us in this situation? And the high priest would use those two stones to reveal what God's purposes for his people were at that moment. Besides determining God's will and working with the people as they brought sacrifices. The most interesting aspect of the priest's work was that they represented God to the people and they represented people to God. Nobody understood that and fulfilled it better than the high priest who had the responsibility and privilege to go into the tabernacle or temple depending on what era it was and they would go into the holy place and they would pray and make sacrifices of incense. But then on one day a year, the Day of Atonement, the high priest had the responsibility and privilege of going not just into the holy place, but beyond the great curtain into the very holy of holies. That 
room, area, where the Ark of the Covenant was with the mercy seat on top. And there above the mercy seat was the, what we call Shekinah glory of God. And one day a year, the high priest would enter in and he would present blood at the corners of the mercy seat. And he would make sacrifices for himself and his people as he represented the people before God. But to go into the very presence of God was an overwhelming thing. The writer of Hebrews challenges us and says, in the very same way that the Old Testament priests were allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. Now, you and I, because we are a kingdom of priests, because we have a royal priesthood we have a part of, it's not just the average priest, but we, like the high priest, not just one day a year, but every day and at any time of the day, have the opportunity to go into the very presence of God, the throne room of grace. The writer of Hebrews says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace of our gracious God. Now, isn't it interesting that you and I couldn't go boldly? Even the high priest, as he went into the Holy of Holies, couldn't go boldly. He went cautiously. Because if God didn't accept the sacrifice, if he came in a way that was irreverent, That high priest's life could be taken on the spot. But God says, I don't want you to have to worry about that. You're my child. I want you to come to me. I want you to turn to me. I want you to pray to me. I want you to interact with me. Come boldly to the throne of grace to find grace. In exactly the right time, there's mercy and grace and love waiting, waiting, waiting for us. The saddest part is not that we might walk in and boom, but the fact that so many of us don't even bother to go in. We have this incredible privilege of being in the presence of God, interacting with him on a personal way, And yet so many of us don't take time to either read the word or pray and enjoy that relational presence. And that's what so uniquely sets us apart from anybody else. That we have access and opportunity to interact relationally with a God who loves us. A God who delights in showing grace and mercy in our lives. You've been created for this special relationship. You've been called to this. Peter is saying, access the throne room. Access the Holy of Holies. Spend time with God in a way that unbelievers can't even begin to understand. But then he says, okay, you've got this Family relationship, you're a part of this house that God is building and you need to fit in. You're a part of this priesthood and you have access to God. He gives us one last description then of who we are. And that is the fact that we are a chosen nation. A chosen nation. Do you remember a couple weeks ago when when we were talking about the word holy, I gave you a general definition of what the word holy means. Does anybody remember that? It simply means that we are separated. We are distinct. We are unique. We are called to be different. Peter uses that same concept here when he says, you are a chosen people, a holy, and he's not referring now in this moment to our moral purity, but the fact that we have been chosen and we have been distinctly separated from the unsaved. God has called us to be his special possession. This is so amazing. Do any of you have, you don't have to raise your hand, but I wonder, did any of you grow up having a special toy, a doll or something that was so special? 
special to you that even after it was old and it was kind of falling apart you and you were clearing out other stuff you oh I can't get rid of that 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 toy that doll that thing is special to me you have this unique kind of loving relationship with this toy or this thing that was a part of your life and childhood and you hold on to that. Yeah, I can't get rid of that. I can't, I can't put that in the garage sale. I can't throw that one away. Peter reminds us that we have a relationship with God and he looks at us and he says, you're special to me. You're special. You don't have to worry because you're looking a little tattered these days. You're a little broken these days. With all of my flaws and my failures, I am so grateful to know that when God looks at me, he says, Steve, you're special to me. You're special. You don't have to worry that I'm going to get rid of you in a garage sale, Steve. You don't have to worry that because you've been a little ripped and torn that I'm going to throw you away. You're special to me. You're valuable to my heart. You're a keeper, Steve. I'm going to hold on to you all the way into eternity. I go, wow, wow. Nobody knows my flaws better than I do. And nobody knows yours better than you, except God. He knows everything about us. All of our strengths and weaknesses, all of the successes and all of the failures, all those great things that we do for him in the kingdom, and yet all of those times that we've so miserably, miserably sinned. Isn't it amazing that we have a God who looks at us and says, you're still special to me. You're still special. Wow. You're part of a family. You're a house that's being built up and you're being used as a stone that was uniquely shaped and prepared. You're part of a priesthood that has access to the Father, and you are a special possession to God. The Apostle Paul takes all four of these concepts and he celebrates them when he writes in Ephesians chapter two. So now you Gentiles, you people who weren't born into the covenant promises that God had with Israel, you Gentiles who at one time weren't believers but now are, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. Look at this. He says, you are citizens along with all of God's holy people. That's the fourth one we just looked at. The fact that we're a part of this unique nation called and special to God. Together with as his house, there's that spiritual house that we were just talking about, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And we were carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple. That's that ministry of priests that we have, where we have access to the Father. All these things that that represent family, house, citizenship, and the temple. And he says, this is who you are. This is who you are. Don't forget it. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does it mean to be a Christian? This is who we are. But then Peter says, all right, beyond the question of who are you, we also have to recognize why we're here. Why we're here as Foreigners in this world, as aliens, as strangers to our culture. Why are we here? Peter communicates that every one of us as followers of Jesus have two primary purposes for being here. The first one is so that we can praise God. I mean, God could have taken us the moment we're saved. Okay, Steve, you don't have to worry about going to hell now because you've put your trust in Christ. So I'm going to take you right to heaven. No, God says, Steve, I'm going to leave you here for a while. You have a journey of faith that you're going to go on. And in this journey of faith, you have an important reason to be here. And that is so that you can learn how to praise God and celebrate him. Peter puts it this way when he says, you are God's special possession so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You are here so that your life will be a celebration of praise. 
Now, this is kind of interesting. God delights in praise so much that he says, Steve, I'm going to let you live out and travel this journey of faith so that you're always praising me, praising me, praising me. That's hard for the unbeliever to understand. There's a book that was recently written called An American Gospel by a man named Eric Rees, who is a resident writer at a university in Lexington, Kentucky. Rees grew up in a Christian home, but never embraced Jesus for himself. And he's rebelled against everything that he understood as a young man growing up in a Christian home. In fact, he's rebelled against it to the point where he says, when God is wanting us to give him our hearts and to be the first focus of our devotion, when God is asking us to praise him, it's nothing more than God being, if God even exists, God is nothing more than egomaniacal. God's an egomaniac, he said. C.S. Lewis struggled with this very issue himself before he was saved. Lewis wrote and said that as he would read through the book of Psalms and over and over again, God is calling for people to praise him. Why would God do that? And Lewis wrote about this challenge to his understanding of God in a book called Reflections on the Psalms. And he said at that point in his life when he would read these calls for people to worship and praise God, he thought God was craving for worship like a vain woman who wants compliments. There's a Christian speaker who goes to universities and secular campuses, and, and he talks about how young people struggle with this whole idea of God wanting to be praised, praised, praised. And he described the questions that these young people ask him when he said, this is kind of, the if you were to word everything that they're asking, how can you worship a God who is so self-exalting and so self-centered as the God of the Bible? A God who constantly is pointing to his own greatness and constantly telling people that they should recognize this greatness and tell them how much you like it. Was that all our God is? This crazed, craving, egomaniacal person who all he wants to do is be praised, praised, praised as if he were just an average person who has an inflated ego. As you study the Bible, you find that it's exactly the opposite. I love, this week I had a chance to read an article by John Piper who describes the answer to this issue in a simple sentence when he says, God lives for the glory of God. God lives for the glory of God. And as we study the Bible, what we understand about the nature of God is that God is the ultimate good in the universe and everything that he is and everything that he does is good and praiseworthy. And God has this amazing ability to celebrate himself as the ultimate source of everything that is good. And he, even more than just celebrating this goodness in himself, creates all things and all things ultimately point to the glory, the goodness of God. And nowhere is God more honored and glorified than in those who are saved, those who praise him and celebrate his goodness, his goodness, his goodness. It's not ego. It's simply truth. That God is praiseworthy. That God is the most pure and perfect being in all of the universe is worthy of praise. And whenever God does something that honors and glorifies himself, he invites us to enjoy and celebrate with him. What is the greatest commandment that's been given to us? That we would love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul, mind and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. But to be able to enjoy God in all of this is praiseworthy. It's praiseworthy. Again, Paul celebrates this reality 
when he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for he chose us in him. He predestined us for the adoption as sons in accordance with his pleasure and will for or to the praise of his glorious grace. God invites us to the highest place of fulfillment in our lives. And that is when we are at one with him and praising him. That is the greatest and the highest function that any of us can experience. To miss that is to miss the most fulfilling part of our purpose for being here and on this journey that we have. You, you are God's special possession. And God has you traveling this journey for one ultimate purpose, and that is so that your life brings praise to him. Your life reflects the light. Your life is what's drawing others. And that's what Peter pushes us to the second purpose for our existence. Not only are we praising God, but so others can praise God as well. The unbeliever is drawn to us and drawn to God because of our life of praise. He says, live such good lives among the pagans or unbelievers that though they may accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify or praise God on the day that he visits us. This is exactly what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, all of us, all you are the light. You're the light of the world. And like a city on a hilltop that can't be hidden, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. Everyone benefits. Everybody is warmed. Everybody sees. And in the same way, you let your good deeds shine out for everyone to see so that everyone will be able to praise God and be drawn to him. When they see us, they go, oh, that's what God is like because they see him living in us. Oh, that's the goodness of God because they experience and feel it through our lives. As we interact with people at home, at work, in the neighborhood, at the gym, at school, wherever you find yourself, as you are communicating and living the God life in front of them, they are drawn and they say, wow, as you are sharing your life, as we are doing good. Today, we have the opportunity to do that here at Village Church. We're going to have our trunk or treat. And now, is there anything necessarily spiritual about all of that candy that we're going to give out? No, but it gives us an amazing opportunity to love the light shine and we invite people from our community to come and get to know us and we have the opportunity to introduce ourselves to them but ultimately our purpose is to introduce God to them and as we're interacting with people whether it's here or anywhere else in our lives as we're interacting with people and they see God's life living and shining through us they are drawn and they say Wow, and many of them come to faith so that they can praise, they can celebrate. Why are you on this journey of faith? Number one, so that you can praise God. And number two, so that through your life, others will praise. So we're ready, we're on the journey now. We've arrived in this foreign land that we're a part of and we're being asked, who are you and why are you here? I hope you'll be able to answer those questions as you live out the Christ life every single day. Would you bow with me? Father, 